Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, bed crimers. As always, I wish you the best. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out my channel. Let me just ask that after listening to or watching this video, if you learned something or enjoyed it, please do me a favor and smash that like button. Now let's dig in. Hello, hello. This is part two of my analysis of the Lataw County Prosecutor's motion for a protective order that was filed on June 16th of 2023 and that was released this past Tuesday. If you haven't watched part one, you might want to watch that first and then come back to this video. I felt a part two was in order because I had not shared the entire 33 pages of content with you in part one. Now I'm only going to hit the main points because much of the 33 pages is made up of detailed descriptions of other legal cases that the prosecution is citing to support their arguments in this motion. This motion for an order of protection is basically made up of the prosecutor's arguments for why information related to investigative genetic genealogy, or IgG, used in the case to track down the owner of the male touch DNA found on the leather sheath should be protected from disclosure to Koberger's defense team. Before I dig in, let me remind you of some key terms that appear in the motion. You've just heard me say the acronym IgG, and it stands for, you guessed it, Investigative Genetic Genealogy, which is the emerging science of using genetic and genealogical methods to generate leads for law enforcement entities investigating crimes. In simple terms, IgG involves first extracting mystery DNA found at a crime scene and then uploading it or submitting it to genetic genealogical services like Ancestry.com and 23andMe. The investigators then look to see whose names pop up as potential relatives of that mystery person whose DNA was found at the crime scene. The investigators use any and all matches to build a family tree, and then they narrow the family tree down to the owner of the DNA through the percentage of match made. Here's an example of a case that used IgG to track down a dangerous perpetrator, the Golden State Killer, the serialist who was responsible for at least 13 murders and 45 RAPESs throughout California in the 70s and 80s, eluded law enforcement for many decades. But in 2017, investigators reopened the case and they extracted DNA from one of the victims, RAPE, kits that was done back when the crime occurred. The investigators submitted the mystery DNA to GED Matt, which is an online service that pools results from various genealogy DNA tests and testing companies. The DNA matches led investigators to possible relatives of the unknown suspect. Using those relatives' names, investigators built a family tree for the mystery monster. Two months later, they had a short list of names. And then in April of 2018, the police finally arrested Joseph D'Angelo. They had finally determined that the DNA belonged to D'Angelo, and they were right because he finally fessed up and pleaded guilty to multiple counts and was sentenced to life in prison. The methodology used in that case evolved into this new field of investigative genetic genealogy. In the case of the Idaho Four, investigators basically did the same thing. One, they extracted the male touch DNA found on the snap of the leather sheath. Two, they submitted that DNA profile to various genetic genealogy services. Three, they took any potential relatives whose names popped up and built a family tree for the mystery owner of the DNA. And four, eventually investigators whittled the DNA matches down to one Brian Koberger. Another term you're going to hear in this part two is STR DNA. That stands for Short Tandem Repeat DNA Analysis. 
analysis. STR DNA analysis involves looking at 20 regions within human DNA, and it allows law enforcement to make a direct comparison between two STR DNA profiles. So in the case of Brian Koberger, investigators were able to compare the STR DNA profile that emerged from the DNA found on the snap of the leather sheath to the DNA of their primary suspect, Brian Koberger, after they took a cheek swab from him on December 30th, 2022. So with those key terms now defined, let me share the additional information from the final pages of the prosecution's motion for a protective order. Apparently in Idaho, there are no other cases that have ruled on whether all IgG information has to be shared with the defense team. However, the prosecutors do cite rulings about IgG disclosures from cases out of other states. What I'm gleaning from all of this is that the defense team wants to see the names of all the relatives of Brian Koberger who popped up on genetic genealogy services like Ancestry.com, and 23andMe when the DNA from the snap of the leather sheath was submitted, and the prosecution does not want to share those names with the defense or with the public. Those would be the names of the hundreds of relatives of Brian Koberger, maybe some close relatives, maybe some distant, who were used to create his family tree. I suspect that the defense team wants to see that family tree to determine if one of Brian Koberger's relatives could also be a match the DNA extracted from the leather sheath. Maybe not as much of a match, but maybe a little bit. I'm speculating here. The defense may want to legitimately see if there are any other relatives who have some sort of match to the DNA, or they may be trying to find relatives who could be used to create reasonable doubt as to whether or not Brian Koberger is the person who left the DNA on the snap. That's my take on this, and the reason I came to that conclusion is that the prosecution cited two cases in the motion, and looking at those cases, you definitely get that impression. So let me talk about those right now. One is a case called United States versus Johnson. In that case, which took place in Ohio, law enforcement recovered a suspect's DNA from a baseball cap that was left at the scene of a bank robbery. Note to self, wear a knit cap if you ever rob a bank. That's much less likely to come off your head. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'd never rob a bank. A candy store? That I might rob. Investigators ran the DNA through CODIS and received multiple hits, including a hit for the person who would later become the defendant, meaning the person the police believed was the bank robber. Investigators ended up taking a cheek swab from this person, and a scientist was then able to make a match between this person and the DNA found on the baseball cap. Apparently, the defendant, through his legal team, tried to force the prosecution to share the names of the other people who were hits for that DNA in CODIS. The court denied the defendant's request, explaining that the DNA evidence material to the defense was the direct comparison between the DNA on the baseball cap and the DNA taken from the defendant's cheek swab, nothing else. The Lataw County prosecutor is saying that in the case of the Idaho 4, the IgG information, just like the initial multiple hits in CODIS in the bank robbery case I just talked about, is not material to the defense team because it only shows how Koberger was first identified as a suspect. The Lataw County prosecutor goes on to say that the IgG information could not support an argument from Koberger and his defense team that law enforcement violated his Fourth Amendment rights by entering the DNA collected from the sheath into a genetic genealogy service. The prosecution wrote, quote, a defendant cannot prove a violation of the Fourth Amendment without first showing that he or she had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the place search, end quote. 
FYI, the Fourth Amendment protects people from unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. The key words there are unreasonable searches. So perhaps the prosecution is concerned that the defense is going to try and say that Koberger's Fourth Amendment rights were violated when the DNA from the leather sheath was submitted into genetic genealogy services. Or maybe the prosecution knows that the defense will try to argue that and get that DNA evidence thrown out as it would not be allowed to be shared during Koberger's trial, meaning if it violated his Fourth Amendment rights. The prosecution then talks about the leather sheath being abandoned at the crime scene with the DNA inside it. I'm assuming by saying inside it, they mean inside on the snap. They wrote, quote, Defendant cannot show that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy in DNA left at the scene of a quadruple homicide or in the genetic information of his relatives who voluntarily provided their own DNA to a genetic genealogy service, end quote. Good point. The relatives submitted their DNA by themselves because they wanted to. They wanted to learn about their background and they wanted to see the people they might be related to or that they are related to. It's not their fault that their DNA led to Koberger being linked to the DNA on the leather sheath. The prosecution then goes on to state that they did not rely on the IgG information to establish probable cause to arrest Brian Koberger did not present the IgG information to the grand jury, and they have no plans to present the IgG information at trial. Instead, they say they've relied on and will continue to rely on the STR DNA analysis comparing Koberger's DNA from his cheek swab to the DNA that was found on the leather sheath to establish his guilt. And get this, the prosecution even wrote that although the DNA on the leather sheath once belonged to the defendant, meaning to Koberger, he abandoned the DNA when he left it at the crime scene of a quadruple homicide. That is interesting wording. Basically, the prosecution is saying that Koberger cannot claim ownership of that DNA, nor can he say that he has a property interest in the information gleaned from the genetic genealogy services using his DNA and that of his relatives. In short, the prosecution argues none of the IgG information it wants to protect came directly from the defendant or currently belongs to him. And for this reason, under Rule 16b-4 of Idaho criminal law, the prosecutor is not required to share it with the defense. Bottom line, the prosecution is trying to protect what it calls hundreds of innocent civilians from having their personal information, including their names, their birth dates, and familial connections to Brian Koberger from being disclosed. And again, just to be clear, those hundreds of innocent civilians would be relatives near and far of Brian Koberger. The second case mentioned in the motion that I found interesting is called In the Matter of Michael Green, Ruling on Motion to compel production of discovery. The prosecution cited this case to make its point. In green, law enforcement used DNA that was recovered from a victim's nightgown to identify the defendant as a possible suspect. Note this nightgown story is not from the Brian Koberger case. Instead, it's from another case called green. I don't want to confuse anyone. The prosecution writes that in green, after law enforcement used DNA recovered from the victim's nightgown to identify the defendant as a possible suspect, they then surreptitiously, meaning secret, recovered items from that defendant's garbage that contained DNA and found through STR DNA testing that the DNA in the defendant's garbage matched the DNA found on the victim's nightgown. A saliva test later confirmed that the defendant's DNA matched the DNA on the victim's nightgown. The defendant's defense team then, quote, moved to compel the disclosure of the IgG information. After an in-camera hearing, the court denied the motion. The court explained why, like this, evidence that is material to the defendant's guilt or 
innocence is the testing that followed the IgG investigation, which directly compared a fresh swab of the defendant's DNA with the DNA profile collected from the victim's nightgown. It is only this evidence that the people, meaning the prosecution, intend to present at trial. The prosecution is not obligated to provide its preliminary search of the genealogy databases for possible matches, which is investigatory in nature and is not exculpatory or material to the defendant's defense, end quote. I think what is important to note here is that the prosecution was saying that they only have to share evidence that they intend to present during the trial with the defense. Thus, they only need to show the testing that was done when a fresh swab from the defendant was compared to the DNA profile that was collected from the victim's nightgown. The prosecution does not need to provide its preliminary search of all those genealogy databases for possible matches because they're not going to share that information at trial. So to me, this makes me think once again that in the Koberger case, Koberger's defense team wants to see the results of the preliminary searches of those genetic genealogy services to see all the relatives near and far of Brian Koberger. The Latah County prosecutors then wrote this about the Green case. As this case illustrates, the state is not required to disclose the IgG information under Rule 16a because the IgG info the state seeks to protect is not favorable to Koberger on the issues of guilt or punishment. The prosecutors go on to say that the information provided to local law enforcement by the FBI was nothing more than a tip, a lead for local law enforcement to follow up on if they wanted to. The genealogical tip telling them to look at Brian Koberger did not prove or substantiate Koberger's guilt. So yeah, they're saying that all the FBI did was provide a tip that a guy named Brian Koberger might be the perpetrator. It was then up to local law enforcement investigators to take Koberger's name and do additional DNA testing with items of trash from the Koberger family home with that cheek swab from Brian Koberger once they did the search of the Koberger home. And at the end of the day, the prosecution is asking the court to protect the IgG information from disclosure. I'm going to stop there because I've said IG... I can't even say it. IgG about 50 million times. And I could use a glass of wine. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories. Hey, smash that like button. Subscribe if you're not yet subscribed. It doesn't cost you anything. And I'll see you next time.